Thank you, worship team. We're so grateful even just to, to sing this morning. I hope your hearts were encouraged at home, wherever you may be watching this. And uh, I want to return to where we begin last week. We're just taking a little time here to uh, take a few weeks until we can grab a, a greater time frame to be together to start really the book of Ephesians. And I've titled this message, The Cure for Anxiety in a Pandemic Age, Part 2. Obviously, we looked at Part 1 last week, and we looked at the shield of faith. This week on Part 2, I want to take up the sword of the Spirit and all prayer. The sword of the Spirit and all prayer. Maybe you would ask, as I mentioned last week regarding the title, Am I Concerned for You? Because I've titled it The Cure for Anxiety in a Pandemic Age. And you remember I said my answer is no. Your faith in God, uh, your love for the saints is strong. And in the midst of this crisis, it's, it's really a beauty to behold. Uh, actually, really what my desire is, is to empower you and speak to you the Word of God so that you can come alongside friends and come alongside family who are anxious, who are anxious. It could be that you're anxious for the future, and if you hear me use that word anxious Today, I will use anxious and worry, and those will be interchangeably used. But one said this of worry. He said that worry is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. I think that's well said, a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. I think that's true. When we allow anxiety or worry to enter into our life, if it consumes us, it could cut a channel into which every other item is drained. In fact, I found it interesting that even the Mayo Clinic, medically speaking, said that all anxiety begins in the mind. It begins there. And maybe we're talking on this theme and you're saying, well, where does it come from? Well, it begins in the thought process. In fact, the old English term for worry meant to choke or to, or to strangle. And really what worry and anxiety does is it strangles the mind. Now, I mentioned last week, in fact, you can turn there just as we begin, and we won't stay there, and I'm getting to that point, but look over in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, in verses 25 down through 34, four different times there we are told exhorted, if you will, to not be anxious. You could see it in 625. Jesus said, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Look at verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious or literally worried, can add a single hour to his span of life? If you look down in verse 31, therefore... Jesus said a third time, do not be anxious. And then if you look at verse 34, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow. Four different times there is a command to not be anxious, to not be worried. Now we begin to ask, what does that word mean? What does it mean to be filled with anxiety or to be filled with worry. And that Greek word there, it's the word for anxious, depending on your translation. It's the word for worry, is the Greek word meri manao. Meri manao, it comes from two separate Greek words. And the words mean to divide is one of the words. And attached to the other word, 
the mind. And so it's a division of the mind. In other words, you become anxious or worried over something in the future. But it begins in the mind and certainly it could have physical consequences. About a week ago, uh, our resolved high school ministry had a, had a Zoom call with our wonderful missionaries, John Paul and Sarah. And one of the questions our high school pastor asked Sarah Stepanian, he asked for what's the greatest thing to be in Uganda and asked them as a couple, what was the hardest thing to be in Uganda? And he asked Sarah specifically, what's been the hardest thing in Uganda? And I thought her, her answer was very interesting. Obviously, this in the age in which we're in is not easy for each of us. There's a number of reasons that make this diff a difficult time for the states and globally. But when he asked Sarah, what's been the hardest thing for them in Uganda, she had a very quick response without a smile, two words, and of course, she wasn't joking, she just said, staying alive. That's what she said. In other words, they've been there for less than a year, and they've battled snakes in the house, fevers up to 108, malaria with shaking fevers, doctor's visits that sometimes take three days to make the correct adjustments. And she meant every word of that, staying alive. Now the question that could be asked is, is that what Jesus is talking about? When, when he said, do not be anxious for tomorrow, is, there, is she anxious about the future if someone has a 108 degree fever or when someone has a deep bout of malaria or when there's insects and snakes 12 feet long that are there surrounded by that jungle? I would say, is she anxious? And my answer would be no. She's not anxious. She's just what we call, you would understand that, biblically concerned. She's concerned. And the reason I mention that is I need to make a clarification for you because if I look at the text there and the command to not be anxious, certainly that's a command, and anxiety can be a sin. But sometimes that Greek word is used in other places not in a negative way to speak of anxiety and worry. That would be a sin and it's used negatively. Sometimes that word in the New Testament is used as a concern is the word. And it's used positively. And you have to begin to clarify those things as a Bible teacher and even for your own thinking on this. Lest you think anytime you're concerned you're in sin. Paul wrote this. You don't have to look it up. Maybe you could write it down. He wrote this in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight. 28. The Apostle Paul said, Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Paul mentioned there the daily concern. It's the same word for anxiety. But he didn't call it anxiety there. In the New Testament, the translators called it concern. He says, apart from the daily pressure on my life is the concern for all the churches. You would agree with me. That's not sin. That's a godly response. In fact, he said in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty nine, 29, who is led into sin without my intense concern? He was concerned for the Corinthians. Who getting into sin would not be a reason for Paul to be intensely concerned. I am and was this week intensely concerned for some of our saints at Grace Church of the Valley. And far from thinking I'm anxious, I'm actually just concerned. Paul used that word again in a positive sense. In second, excuse me, in Philippians 2.20, when he said in Philippians 
regarding Timothy, he said, I have no one else of kindred spirit who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. In other words, I'm sending Timothy to you because I have no one else other than this man who will be who will have a kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. That's a godly response. So we're making a distinction negatively when that word is used, it's anxiety and worry. But in other places in the New Testament, it's used positively to speak of concern. So, beloved, some concerns are biblical in nature. In fact, I would say they're not only biblical in nature, they're even responsible. However... Worry or anxiety over our basic needs is sin. And sometimes we walk a fine line between godly concern and the sin of anxiety. But it's probably true, you're wondering there, sitting on your couch or your, you know, at your table, and you're thinking, what's the difference then between sinful anxiety and worry And that of maybe a biblical concern. Well, let me say this to you. When a good concern crosses over the line and becomes anxiety, it ceases to be motivated by love. Instead, you become motivated by fear. And any time fear begins to grip your heart, or my heart, and become the main motivator, the concern is no longer the well-being of the other person. No, rather, it's a desire for control. It's a desire for safety. So, in one sense, anxiety then, or worry, is a concern that gets out of control. In other words, virtually every expression of anxiety begins with a legitimate concern that we then allow to consume us, to to consume who we are and all. It cuts that channel that we spoke about at the beginning. When we or when you or I fail to bring that concern into God's throne room in order to see it from his perspective, then it turns into anxiety for you. It turns into worry. So anxiety and worry are typically matters of concern that we fail to deal with in a biblical way. In fact, usually our worries or our anxiety involve earthly things like your job, like your marriage, your money, your possessions, your health, your children. Maybe some of you students are concerned about school, but maybe some of you aren't because you can't get a lower grade than you had once this virus put us in shelter in place. So a concern could be godly, it could even be responsible, but when you or I, fixate on them, when you begin to attach your heart to them, then you can live in perpetual anxiety about them. So fear and worry and anxiety then are different than a godly concern. We understand that, and I'm just trying to make sense of that so that, you know, we don't get over-spiritual and Think thou back at my illustration of Sarah Stepanian. She's just being a good mom. She's just concerned. She's just trying to stay alive. She's not controlled by her fear of lack of God's control. She's concerned in a good way over her children. We would say that's responsible. So stress and pressure are not always bad things. They are good things if they drive you actually to take action. Concerns actually make us do something to ease the situation in which we find ourselves in. But worry, anxiety, burdens our hearts. It burdens our minds without really accomplishing a solution. 
It was the missionary Corey Ten Boom, wonderful biography, wonderful movie made of her. But she said this about worry. She said that worry is like racing the engine without letting in the clutch. You burn energy and you go nowhere. I thought that was good. It's like racing, worry, anxiety, the engine, without letting in the clutch, you burn energy, but you go nowhere. So four different times, Jesus said here in Matthew 6, do not be anxious. But then he said something, and I want you to see it, and this is where we're going to jump off, at least this week. He says at the end of verse 30, he says, it's alive today and tomorrow the close, the grass of the field. He says there, it's thrown, verse 30, into the oven. Will not, he says, will he not much more clothe you? And then that phrase, O ye of little faith. And it was that phrase, little faith, that got me thinking on anxiety here and worry and made me go over at that point to Ephesians 6. So I want you to turn over there. I want you to come back for one final week as we jump from that arena of do not be anxious. And again, we're making a distinction between anxiety and godly concern. But here it was sinful anxiety, at least in Matthew 6. And he said of us, O ye of little faith. And what I did last week and really what I did this week is I'm beginning with my application, which is really odd for me. Usually I would take you through Matthew 6. In fact, I've already been studying for that for a couple weeks, but I, I got to this phrase on, O ye of little faith, and it led me down the path here. Is there a cure for anxiety? Is there a cure for anxiety in this pandemic age? And the answer is yes. And scripture gives us the perfect remedy, or we could say the perfect weapon for such a condition. And I draw your attention to Ephesians 6, verses 16 through 18. Look at him with me again. He says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To, to that end, he says, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And so here is the remedy, here are the weapons that he gives so that you and I might walk in great faith, not little faith. Now as we come into Ephesians 6, we know it's a passage on the armor of God, you know that. It is what we call a prison epistle. So Paul is likely sitting in a Roman jail cell. He is chained to a Roman soldier and he is looking at the physical components of the Roman soldier's gear, if you will. He's looking at the armor and he is in this text here transforming them into some profound spiritual truths. Look back at verse 10. He says, even in our battle against the enemy, the devil, he said, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, he exhorts us there in verse 11 to put on the whole armor of God. Paul says that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For you fight not against flesh and blood, verse 12, but against the cosmic powers and so forth, against the present darkness. And so, beloved, you need to put on the armor of God. And we begin last week, and we don't have to return there, with the shield of faith. And we said it wasn't the small round shield on the left arm, it was the big door. It was the, the wooden plank, if you will. And he transformed that physical shield into the shield of faith. And it wasn't saving faith, that came in Ephesians 2. This is faith as a believer. This is living faith. 
So faith here, when he talks about the shield of faith last week, you could watch that on our website, you could watch that on YouTube, is not your faith, I just want to be clear there, it's not your faith that becomes the shield, the object of your faith is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's promises. That shield that we spoke about last week is believing the character of God, believing the promises of God, and it's that shield of faith, that four foot by two and a half foot door, if you will, that extinguishes the darts of doubt, the dart of despair, and the dart of discontent. And I would say that we could conquer any battle, any spiritual battle, You could even say any anxiety now through the two weapons that are supplied to us. And what follows here is the weapon of the Word of God and the weapon, if you will, of all prayer. And I spoke last week of the first remedy for anxiety being the transforming power of the Word of God. And what I want to do right now is just take you a a step further in the text. A step beyond what I said last week of the transforming power of the Word of God. And I want to take you here first in verse 17. Look there. He mentions the helmet of salvation. But then he talks there of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So here's two weapons to counteract the evil one or counteract anxiety He gave us the shield of faith, but now he gives us these weapons. The shield of faith, you understand, was defensive in nature. You get behind the promises of God. You bear up under the word of God. You remind yourself of the truth of God. You remind yourself not of your faith, but his promises and the the joy that he has given us to walk with him. But he gives us here now two weapons this morning. The first weapon is the word of God. The word of God. Look at 17 again. He says, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, we have to ask the question, what sword is Paul talking about? And I only would tell you this because I think it makes a difference in how we understand this word. There were two swords that were predominant amongst the soldiers at this time. There was a great sword a great sword. Number one, it was called a ramphea. A ramphea. And it could be as long as 40 inches, if you will. And it was a massive sword. In fact, it sometimes had to be held by two hands. In fact, I, I brought you one this morning. Let me see if I could find it. Here is from one of our local muse- museums. A large sword. This would be something of a, of a ramphea that could be up to 40 inches long. Now this one you can hold with one hand. But this sword was a little bit bigger than this one. And you sometimes had to wield it with two hands. In fact, that ramphea sword is the one that was used in the book of Revelation in 116 that when Christ would speak out of the the sword of his mouth, if you will. It was talking about this sword being a symbol of truth, and it was used in 116, 212 in those seven churches, 216 in chapter 19, 15. It was telling of him speaking the word of truth out of the sword of his mouth. It was describing this large Ramphaea sword, but I want you to know I should stop there. That's not what he's talking about here. When Paul says to you, and and you take it off verse 17, you take up the helmet of your salvation. That word take up is an imperative command. And so he's saying not only take your helmet, but take up, and he's commanding you to do this, the sword of the Spirit. You say, well, what sword is he talking about? Well, he's talking about this kind of sword. He's talking about, you say, well, Scott, how do you know that? It's simply the Greek word. The Greek word is not here a ramphea sword used in the book of Revelation. The word here for sword in Ephesians 6.17 is makaira. And maybe you've heard about that before. 
A Machaira sword is anywhere from 6 to 18 inches long. And it was carried, if you will, in the, in the soldier's sheath, we, we could call it. And it was used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's the word that he's talking about here. He's telling you as a believer, listen, you need to get behind the shield of faith. That's defensive. But if you're going to have victory in the Christian life, then you need to pull out your Machaira sword. Now, uh, let me just take you a step further. What's he talking about? Look at the text again in verse 17. He says to take the sword, and then he says here, of the Spirit. In other words, he's commanding you to do something. And I, and I just, I have to acknowledge that. If you're in the midst of a battle with your enemy and here the evil one, you have some responsibility. Of course you do. There's imperatives all over the book of Ephesians from 4 to 6. And one of those imperatives is to take up the sword. Now it's described here, the sword of the Spirit. The thought in the language is you take up the sword which is given by the Spirit is the thought. In other words, when you came to Christ, not only did the Holy Spirit take up possession in you, but you were given a weapon to do battle. You were given, if you will, a machaira to do battle. It's a sword that is given to you by the Spirit. In fact, you could even translate this, take the sword of the Spirit, or take the sword that the Spirit provides you. So you're to go into this armor, you've got this shield, you're, you, there's other pieces, but you're taking up this Machaira. Now, what is it? You might be asking. Okay, it's a little bit, uh, what, is, what is the sword provided by the Spirit? Well, look in the text. It tells us what it is, and you can see that. It says at the end of 17, which is the Word of God. And so here, the Spirit is providing you as a believer with the sword, and the sword is the Word of God. Beloved, if there's just a word here, it is the Holy Spirit that enables you to understand, enables you by the Spirit of God to wield the Word of God. You have been given a sword by the Spirit so that you may use it against Satan's attack. It would be as though if you're going into battle, you're going to take that door, that shield of faith, because as the extinguishing missiles coming in, you can't just sit out there and say, I've got, I've got nothing to protect me. No, you need to get behind that shield. That's defensive. Now you have an offensive weapon that's been put into your hand. It's a machaira, but here it's defined spiritually transformed to be the word of God. Now, let me just take you just a step further in the text. I think it will help you. This is all application for you. Now, look at the text again. You can underline this word in 17. It's the sword of the Spirit, which is... Now, it says there, the Word of God. Now, just stop there for a second. You say, well, Scott, it's... it's the Word of God. Now, I know that, and you know that, and I can see that, and you can see that. But you know there's different words in the Greek language for the Word of God. One of them is graphe, and it just means it is written. And whenever you see graphe, it is the written scriptures. That's not the word here. Another one of the words that's used to speak of the Word of God, I think you would understand, is the word logos. In fact, there's a Bible software named logos it is showing you the Word of God. Jesus, of course, in the beginning was the Word, Logos. He was in the beginning and so forth. And Jesus Christ personified that Word. He was the Logos. And when you see Logos, that's the word for message. It, it, in other words, the Scripture is written, graphe, Logos contains the whole message. You could actually just say the Logos is the message of the Bible. That's not the word used here. And you say, well, what's the word used here? Well, I think it's interesting. You say, well, it says there it's the word of God, and it is, but he uses, does Paul, the word, word is the Greek word rhema, okay? Okay. 
In other words, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema of God, okay? And so here, rhema, you say, what is that? Well, it makes a difference in this battle. It is a, the best way to say it to you is a specific statement of Scripture. In other words, when you're in the battle and you got your, you're behind your shield, but when you're going hand to hand, you're going to take that machaira, you're going to take that sword, which is the Word of God, and you're going to use it offensively, if you will, and it is to use the Scripture as a rhema of God, a statement of God. Now, practically, still I'm pushing that way, how do you wield that sword in battle? I mean, how do you, how do you use that? What's he, what's he still talking about? Well, let me just say this to you. When you're in the midst of a temptation, I think here's the application. You cannot just... I mean, you can, but you just can't quote John 3.16 to cure your anxiety or to win the battle, okay? In other words, if you don't know what God's Word says about lust, you need to battle lust with a specific statement. You need to battle forgiveness with a specific statement of Forgiveness. You need to battle the sin of hypocrisy or deceit or lying or stealing or pride and you need to deal with it according to the Scripture. Now now listen, I don't want to make much of this, but he did not mention graphe here. He does not mention logos. He says you take up that sword. He transfers it into a spiritual principle so that you can use that as a rhema of God. You say, well, Scott, how does that work? Well, uh, let me show you. Go over to the book of Matthew for a second, okay? Go to the book of Matthew and go to specifically to Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus entered into his temptation, okay? In fact, let me read that for you. And I want you to see how our precious Lord wonderfully use the sword of the Word of God to defend himself against the attacks of Satan. Look at 4, 1 through 3. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit, interesting, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So you open up, you know the account. Here is the account. He is in the wilderness. I've been in that area. And believe me, it is just barren. It is a place where there's no vegetation at this wilderness, this Judean wilderness. It is a place of barrenness. It is a place of rocks. It is utterly hot there, like one of the heats that we can feel, one of the heat waves that comes through here in the central valley very similar to our climate throughout the year actually and here is the thought here he's fasting he's there for 40 days alone it says and out comes the attack in fact after he's been fasting it says then the devil came and the first temptation he's obviously going to be hungry 40 days fasting, and the devil comes to him and says, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, you and I know, we just finished teaching through the gospel of John for a few years that the supernatural wasn't a problem for Christ. He performed many signs, many miracles. The issue here is the question, if you are the son of God, if As if there's doubt when, if you look back in your Bible, just one chapter, probably the same page at Matthew 3, 17, after the baptism of Jesus, behold, a voice came from heaven, this is my beloved son with whom, God said, I am well pleased. This is my beloved son. Now here, just in the next chapter, he's out in this wilderness fasting for 40 days, 
and Satan ask him that question, if you are the son of God. See, beloved, the real test was not a temptation about hunger. It was a test, if you will, to doubt the truth of what God had already said. In other words, he just wanted him to doubt the word, doubt the character of God, doubt the promise of God. And here, he says, if you are the son of God, why are you starving in the wilderness? Satisfy yourself. How could the father, Satan insinuates, let the son go hungry? In fact, what are you even doing in the, de the desert? And more than just satisfying, if you will, the physical hunger for food, Satan was tempting Jesus to doubt the Father's love, to doubt the Father's provision. If you are the Son of God, then command that these stones, if you will, become bread. But he responded, look, for, for man... In fact, he answered, it is written. Now, it's, it's the word graphe. It's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. He said, well, what is he doing? Well, you understand he's quoting the scripture. But I just want you to understand that he's, he's not quoting Leviticus here. He is quoting out of the book of Deuteronomy. And he's answering that temptation. Here's what you need to see. With a specific word from God. And it comes out of Deuteronomy 8.3. He skillfully, if you will, takes the written word, but gives a specific word according to the temptation. He's wielding, is the Lord Jesus Christ, masterfully the Machaira sword in the face of the devil's onslaught. There's a second temptation. Look at it in verse 5. The devil took him to a high, to a holy city, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on the hands they will bear you, on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now, just a couple things. He took him to a high, it says, to the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and he gave him this command. If you're really the son of God, prove it to me. And if you won't use divine power to help yourself, then let God use his divine power to help you. It's interesting, is it not? And you know this, that Satan himself quotes the scripture and he quotes it out of context that's why false teachers we say sometimes are like a broken clock they quote the scripture but they're like a broken clock and that they're right twice a day but the totality of their ministry is using the scripture of false teacher for their own advantage and here satan quotes the scripture but i want you to note our lord's masterful usage of the sword look at verse 7 he says, but Jesus said to, said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to test. He's quoting again, as all three of these passages, Deuteronomy 6.16. He's wielding the sword. In other words, he comes with a specific temptation. He doesn't take out the large broadsword. No, he's hiding that word in his heart, if you will, going on the offensive as Satan comes to him quoting the scripture with great precision, great skill. Third temptation, look at verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. Watch the language. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Here's the third temptation, Jesus, that the devil insinuates. Why submit to God? Why, why be a servant now? Why, why be a servant when I could make you, the devil says, a king now? It's all yours, Jesus. Why would you even wait? Now, we are not told here what high mountain the devil took him. But the devil by the language of the text, gave him an incredible view. 
But I think the view, as you read the text, obviously extended beyond what anybody could humanly and physically see by some kind of supernatural accommodation. The devil must have showed him, as you look at the language, the glories of Egypt. He must have showed him way beyond what you'd physically see to the pyramids, to the temples, to the libraries, if you will. He must have shown Christ the extensive treasures. He showed him the power, maybe the splendor of Rome. He showed him how great maybe Athens was, magnificent Corinth and all of its structure and glory. Maybe he took him to wondrous Jerusalem. It says all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. But Jesus, for the third time, says it is written. And he quoted, you can see there, um, verse 11, where he said, I will give you it all in 9, verse 10. Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Three different times, you know, he wielded what was written, but he wielded it skillfully. <laughs> You know, just a word, it just came into my heart. Even you parents, training your children. Your children have got to understand this biblical worldview. You cannot just walk around in, in massive unclarity, if that's a word. You've got to get clarity in your own life and get clarity in your children's life by hiding the word of God in their heart that they might not sin against me. Christ wielded the word of God, the sword, with mastery. And for each specific temptation brought by the evil one, there was a specific, that's the point, rhema of scripture. Now, beloved, I'm going to say this to you, to my own heart of Jesus Christ, Son of Almighty God, the one in whom there is no sin, the one who had no beginning, the one who brought the very world into existence by the breath of his mouth. If your Lord used specific statements of Scripture in order to resist Satan and win the victory over him, how much more do you and I need to know the Word of God to gain that kind of victory over the devil? Listen, beloved, this is not really a, this is not a game here. You're in a battle. The, the evil one is firing darts at you. Put that shield up to extinguish the incoming flaming darts and missiles. But here, go on the offensive, take the sword, the word of God, the rhema of God, and apply truth to your life. You say, okay, pastor, I understand it, but you might even say, how does it work? Is, is that what you're asking? I mean, how do I wield this? Okay, go back to the book of Ephesians. Let me just put out some examples to you, okay? You, you've got, let's say, the sin of anger. Let's say that you're battling with that. In fact, you might even say, Pastor, I'm not even sure where this anger comes from. Well, let me just say, as you look over into Ephesians chapter 4, anger, biblically, always comes, you might say, well, it's because of this and because of that and this situation and that circumstance and my boss and my husband and my wife or my children or my, and you got something external. Biblically, if you understand anger, all anger comes out of the heart. So the first thing to do when you have anger is to, is to repent because it's a sin issue. But look at verse 26 of chapter 4. It says there to be angry. Now that's talking about a righteous anger. You say, well, mine is a righteous anger. Well, you say, how do I know when he says, be angry and do not sin, how do I know if my anger is righteous? Real simple, okay? Righteous anger is always concerned with the glory of God. Period. <laughs> so if you have anger for any other issue, that's sinful anger. 
which I think rules out maybe 99% of this issue. So you got angry. Look what it, anger, it says, be angry, do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger, verse 27, and give no opportunity to the devil. There's the sin. You say, Pastor Scott, how do I deal with that? Go back to Ephesians 4.22. Put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, here it is, verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in essence in 423 through the word of God. The only way to overcome anger is to take up that weapon of scripture and hide that truth in your heart so that you do not sin with unrighteous anger. Look at verse 24, put on the new self. Created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. So you have to put off the old man, put on the new self. Sandwiched in there is to hide that word in your heart, verse 23. Some people have a foul mouth. I was listening to a conversation at some point this week and every other word it seemed like out of the guy's mouth it was not a conversation I was involved with but overhearing it was a curse word and that, uh, you would agree with me this he doesn't know the Lord he's an unbeliever but when you think about the words forget a, a, a swearing word or a curse word how about just the words that come out of my mouth and your mouth in, in fact look what it says in Ephesians here's how you use the sword it says there, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. So, beloved, when you examine your speech, is it corrupting? Is it, in fact, the NASB used to translate this, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up uh, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear if, if you're thinking, gosh, I just wish I could use words that build up, one of the things that you can do or any of us can do, I can do, is memorize Scripture. You just pray. You're praying. You're using this word in a Machaira-like rhema word so that the word begins to penetrate your heart that you begin to change. You might even be saying, hey, I got bitterness in my heart. I just... There's somebody that I just can't forgive. And that might be you. It could be a situation. It could be 20 years ago. It could be 30 years ago. It could be 50 years ago. It could be a year ago. It could be two years. And you just can't bring yourself to forgive them. And, and so then in the midst of a battle, far from you having victory, you got your shield down. You've let bitterness crawl into you and consume you to the point where bitterness rules your life. Anxiety rules your life. You say, well, what would you do? Well, look at 431. Here's a rhema. Here's a specific word. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. In other words, put it off. You say, pastor, how do I put it off? The Word of God. You begin to replace your human thinking with the power of the Word of God to transform your life. You say, that's what I'm not going to do. What can I do? Verse 32, be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. And here's the example at the end of 32. As God in Christ forgave you. If he forgave you, then how do you not forgive another? So listen, Satan can move his way into the life of a believer through bitterness, through anger, through clamor, through slander, through malice, and you want to inflict evil on people. And Jesus comes back, and Paul here in the scripture, you say, be kind to one another. 
You say, well, that's really hard for me. Well, then you just need to recognize as God in Christ forgave me. Look at chapter 5. It's a chapter break. It just reads as a letter. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In fact, you could look on if you're struggling with lust. You say, well, how do I... How do I put the word in my heart and use the Machaira? Look at 5.3, sexual immorality and all impurity or even covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place but instead let there be what? Thanksgiving. Beloved, listen, this is how you begin to take the Word of God. You've got to memorize it. You've got to own it. You've got to love it. And you say, well, Scott, I, I, uh, I, uh, I have a general understanding of the Bible, and I've grown up with it all my life, but I, I can't definitely use the sword. <laughs> Let me just say to you, you better learn how. You better learn how. So how do I do that? You can take advantage of one of our equipping classes. Maybe you can become part of what we're going to, Matt Tebow and I are developing on a training center for men. You've got to know it specifically. You say, well, will it be effective? Well, listen, Hebrews 4.12, you know it. The word of God, just thinking of this. This is probably pretty sharp right here. I'm so glad that Brent Lundy just built these. There's a special compartment in the... No, I'm, just, I'm joking. But the, the, the Word of God is living, you know it. It's active. And it's sharper than what? Any two-edged sword piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both, point, both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That's the first weapon. And we're out of time to get to that second weapon, prayer. Maybe we'll pick that up next week.